Okay, colleagues, so um, I think we can start our today's event and welcome to our uh, monthly webinar series on human rights engagement. It's really a pleasure to have you with us today. Today's edition is focusing on a very interesting topic and it is about how we can see more synergies in our collaboration with OHCHR and how we can find ways of uh, um, seeing the complementarity of our mandates in the different uh, scenarios that we work in, in different contexts, noting that OHCHR presence can be uh, presented in different ways from uh, OHCHR field office as a, a human rights advisor, as a part of the UN mission. So today we will hear uh, a variety actually of uh, um, UNHCR field presences. I, if we can go to the next slide, please, Peter. We have with us three colleagues from OHCHR. First, uh, Said Al Madun, who is uh, uh, representing the Humanitarian Actions Unit of OHCHR based here in Geneva and who will share with us some reflection on OHCHR field presence, presences and our possible um, new ways of collaboration with protection clusters and humanitarian actors. And then we will hear from Elsa Lepenek. Some of you might have already met Elsa in uh, other events we have organized with the Global Protection Cluster Human Rights Engagement Task Team. Elsa is the human rights advisor for a Syria crisis and has really a wealth of experience in this role. And we will also hear another angle from Uladzimir Sherbao, who is currently, currently working with the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine and who will uh, share with us the reflection on um, the angle of the UN human rights uh, mission and the possible ways of collaboration uh, with them. So as you see a very varied, um, I would say profile of panelists, a lot of experience uh, with us. Above all, this session is really an informal opportunity for us to think and brainstorm how we can collaborate with uh, OHCHR as one of the key counterpart of our activities in the field. So please colleagues use actively the chat function. We will be constantly monitoring it and making sure that we can capture all of your questions examples uh, or reflections that you would like to share and bring back to the panelists. Um, if you would like to also intervene and share your experience, you can put up your hand. We will be also monitoring that constantly. So after the panel, we will exchange together and uh, see uh, if we can bring some clarity around your questions or examples. And finally, we hope that we will be coming out of this event with some concrete recommendations on ways forward and how we can also better support you uh, in the future if you have any questions on collaboration with OHCHR. So with that, uh, I think it's time I give the floor directly to Said. Said, uh, over to you. The floor is yours. Uh, uh, if you can share your perspective from the OHCHR Humanitarian Actions Unit. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Said. I'm working with the Humanitarian Action Unit uh, based in Geneva. Uh, in my presentation, I will cover the variety of OHCHR field of presences and also to get to <coughs> identify uh, this diversity among the field of presences and how this can be factored on, on to what extent and the, uh, the, the scale to which OSHR engages in humanitarian action. Uh, can we move to the next slide? So basically, I'll start with the first slide. This is the uh, what where is OHCHR located in the field? So basically, we have four types of field presences. We have 18 country or standalone offices that are located in 18 countries. Some of them are country offices, or some are are standalone, or uh, or, or because they are different in what they call in each country. 
12 regional presences uh, in, 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 uh, in regions and uh, in, in, uh, across the uh, five continents. Uh, human rights components in 12 UN peacekeeping missions and special political missions. And in a number of contexts, OSHR has deployed human rights advisors to the uh, resident coordinators or humanitarian coordinators or the, the same having two hats, resident coordinators and humanitarian coordinators. And this has happened in 43 countries. Next slide. In this slide, basically we are narrowing down our OHR field of presences to situations where uh, there is a humanitarian cluster system or there is a humanitarian emergency. Uh, and these are 27 countries where OHR has a field of presence in 30 of those humanitarian crises. Again, it's the same, but there is another element to this that in certain situations where there is a deterioration of a human rights issues, uh, OSHR can deploy rapid uh, de uh, response where it, uh, it increases the capacity to monitor human rights situation uh, in certain countries. So we have also rapid response uh, as um, uh, to, to respond to certain human rights situations. But this is different from what uh, Commission of Inquiries or fact finding missions do because the, these fact-finding missions or commissions of inquiry are established by Human Rights Council resolutions and they are independent from OSHR. So we need to differentiate between OSHR and commission of inquiries and fact-finding missions. Uh, next uh, slide, you will see this is where OSHR is located. Where are the original offices, the uh, human rights components of peace operations? and where human rights advisors are deployed to support uh, resident coordinators or humanitarian coordinators in uh, crisis situations. Uh, the, the most recently established office is in Burkina Faso. Uh, it was established in October 2021. Uh, we used to have a, a human rights advisor deployed to the resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator in Burkina Faso. In some contexts where we do not have access, we have a virtual office. For example, the uh, OSHR office for Syria is located in Beirut. Uh, so these are like the, uh, each uh, uh, country office has its own story of how it was established uh, in agreement with the country offices. In the next slides, I will go to give an overview what uh, these different OSHR field of presences uh, do in, in, in the real world. So as I said, uh, any OSHR field of presence is established based on an agreement with the host government. So uh, our, our presence is, uh, is basically agreed upon with the host government and our mandate can include uh, I mean any of the following. Each country office has their own mandate that was agreed with the, with the host government. It may include human rights monitoring, uh, public reporting on the country situation, technical cooperation assistance to, uh, to a national government, uh, to civil society, national human rights institutions, uh, supporting uh, legislative reforms, uh, and, um, and also uh, the scope of OSHR's capacity building is always based on a needs assessment. It's agreed upon uh, based on the analysis of the capacity uh, and also the capacity of the local actors. Uh, next uh, slide, uh, we're, we'll cover regional offices. Basically, regional offices, they are located in certain regions uh, and they are based on, uh, we, we, wor we work on a regional office based on consultations with the countries in each region. So uh, when we focus, for example, the Sahar region, uh, uh, a regional office there uh, looks at issues that are cross-cutting across, for example, the Sahar region. Uh, whenever we have a regional office, we also support the country offices in the, uh, in the, in the region. So whenever there is uh, work on capacity building, uh, treaty bodies, engagement with international human rights mechanisms, the regional office supports the country offices uh, and, in, and in some of these country offices you will see some implementation of projects 
uh, and also uh, in the recent two years, uh, regional offices has also deployed and established early warning emergency response teams that supports the country office uh, with regard to analysis, uh, developing early warning, uh, human rights indicators, etc. Next slide. Uh, human rights components in UN uh, peacekeeping missions or political missions. Uh, first, we need to understand that each uh, UN mission is established by United Nations Security Council resolution. Uh, the human rights component of the mission reports to um, the Secretary General Special Representative or, or the, the head of the mission. Uh, usually, uh, the, this reporting mechanism goes to both the head of the mission and also to the uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, also, their mandate is similar to a country offices, but they do beyond than that to support the UN peacekeeping mission in terms of the uh, implementation of the mandate, implementation of the peace operations, uh, bringing a human rights approach to the programming, supporting civil society, uh, national human rights institutions, uh, uh, focusing also on um, uh, how the, the national capacity to bring human rights uh, elements to all kinds of programming. Uh, and we also support the protection of civilians uh, uh, mandate and uh, wh wherever possible we do casualty tracking and we rely a lot on the human rights monitoring uh, as well as also supporting the uh, UN country team in terms of the implementation of the human rights due diligence. Uh, and usually the human rights component are, are regulated by the 2011 UN policy on uh, human rights components in uh, political missions. Uh, next slide. Uh, in this slide, uh, human rights advisors, uh, they are one of one form of OSHR field presences. They are deployed uh, at the request of the UN resident coordinator on behalf of the UN country team. Uh, usually there is uh, consultations between OSHR and the resident coordinator. They agree on the selection of the human rights advisors, but uh, human rights advisors support a lot the UN country team or humanitarian country team in terms of uh, all aspects. Uh, that includes uh, legal analysis, uh, human rights analysis, integrating human rights based approach to all kinds of uh, strategies, uh, whenever, uh, like whether it is humanitarian response plans, HCT protection strategies, or, or any post crisis recovery plans. Uh, and also they work a lot, uh, like in many situations with the uh, civil society organizations, human rights groups, uh, national human rights institutions, uh, and they do uh, like other situations, uh, capacity building, technical support uh, to, to the UN country team, to other UN agencies, uh, as well as promoting engagement with international uh, human rights mechanisms. So you can see across all uh, these field of presences, uh, one of the key outcomes of OSHR is, uh, is the human rights uh, monitoring, uh, the data, the information, the analysis uh, on the legal frameworks, as well as also uh, shaping the narrative in, in these country situations around the human rights and also bringing the human rights based approach uh, uh, in all UN programs and UN strategies. Uh, my last slide is about uh, uh, the, this diversity of OSHR field presences uh, also will reflect upon the OSHR engagement in humanitarian action. And in this regard, I mean, the mandate of each country office, the mandate of the human rights advisor, as well as in a UN peacekeeping mission, since they are different, of course, the engagement will be different. And also, it all depends on the size of the field of presence. In some presences, for example, like take op occupied Palestinian territory, we have 40 staff. In other field of presences, you may have two or three or up to 10 staff. So, and also the scope of the work where you, you are across monitoring documentation of human rights and reporting, or you are more as a technical capacity building office. Uh, and as well as the priorities of each country office. So, uh, and, and also take note that OSHR's mandate is broad. So uh, we, we seek to uh, influence 
not only humanitarian programs, but also development programs and UN peacekeeping missions. Also, we look at how the peacekeeping operations. So the, the broad aspect of OSHR mandate and also the priorities in each field of presence can also determine how we will engage and, 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 and uh, with the scale of our engagement. And the last thing which also we need to factor in is uh, to much, uh, uh, to what extent we have access to the humanitarian architecture. Whenever there is a humanitarian country team is established, are we part of the humanitarian country team or we are not, or we are part of the cluster or we are participating and collaborating with the existing coordination structures. So all of these factors, I think uh, my colleagues will, will flesh out and elaborate more, but this is just an overview of where OSHR is located and the different roles and mandates of OSHR. Uh, over to you, Valerie. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Said. This has been really informative, uh, I believe, for everybody, for me. Uh, definitely, I have already some questions lined up, uh, but I'm sure colleagues uh, do have as well. So you can start posting your questions as uh, they come to you. I will be uh, monitoring them progressively. But uh, now we go first to Elsa. Uh, as already foreshadowed, Elsa is the human rights advisor in Syria. So to hear from you first, and how uh, the work of the human rights advisor look like and what are the opportunities for collaboration. So over to you, Elsa, please. Thanks very much, uh, Valerie. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, well, thanks to the Global Protection Cluster for this new invitation and, and and really, thanks for taking this important initiative this year. It's really appreciated. It's always a very good good occasion to share experience. So I'm I'm, I'm happy to share this uh, Syria experience again, and and have this opportunity to to discuss our lessons learned and challenges in in the Syria response. Um, I also believe that these discussions are important if we want at some point to replicate the, the Syria model of embedding human rights advisors in um, HC's humanitarian coordinator's office uh, or aspects of it um, in future emergency contexts. So um, just to, so I'm, I'm one of the two human rights advisors deployed by the office, by OHCHR, Syria office since 2015. Um, and I'll explain this later. So first slide please so i'll be brief on this first slide just to explain that indeed um we as an office have been part of the un response in the syria crisis since 2011 uh, although as uh, we were not we're not in the country so we're not uh inside the country, so we're not a virtual office, but we haven't been granted um, the what we call the in-country uh, presence um, by the government of Syria, despite repeated requests, as you can imagine. So the office, as, um, as Said, as my colleague has explained earlier, so our office function in, in, um, has as the traditional uh, units and components that a, a human rights presence has uh, in the field. So we, we, of course, have this monitoring and reporting unit. We also have a rule of law and accountability unit with a legal advisor. And we have a civil society and technical cooperation unit. And in addition to those three, I would say, traditional components of a human rights office, we have since 2015, uh, what we call the Human Rights in Humanitarian Action Project or HRAs. So we are two, initially we were three uh, human rights advisors deployed by the office to the offices of each HCs, bearing in mind that in Syria, the whole of Syria approach is a bit different um, and the structure includes three human humanitarian coordinators unlike in other places. So we have the resident coordinator, humanitarian coordinator based in Damascus. Then we have the regional humanitarian coordinator in Amman, and we have a deputy regional humanitarian coordinator 
in Gaziantep, Turkey, who leads the operation for the cross-border operation from Turkey. So this is the what we call the whole of Syria approach, uh, which is indeed a bit uh, unusual. What I wanted to say is that indeed, so the office in 2015, also because of the lack of access and because we work from outside, has decided to deploy initially three human rights advisors to each AHC, um, and now we are two. So my colleague Aziz, also based in Beirut, um, advises the resident coordinator in HC in Damascus. And then I am also based in Beirut, but I advise the two other HCs in Amman and, and Gaziantep. So this is just to, to set up the, the structure of this whole of Syria uh, um, structure that we advise. So basically, when we look at our main methods of work or, or the, the responsibilities that we have as, as HRA, in a nutshell, we have three main uh, responsibilities. One is, of course, the provision of technical advice and support to humanitarian leadership to, to those three humanitarian uh, coordinators, but also to UN agencies through the UN country team and UN um, humanitarian country team. The second is to support the HPC. So it's really to integrate human rights and international standards and the analysis in the humanitarian uh, programming. So it's the HNO and the HRP. And finally, and this is really um, to summarize, finally, we, we're building the capacity of humanitarian actors on uh, IHL and human rights norms. And here it's important to say that many of, I mean, many of these activities um, are based on a thorough understanding of the IHL and human rights development in the grounds. And this is uh, made possible through the office extensive, extensive monitoring efforts. And that's why it's important to look at the HRA's role as part of a package. And that's also why Syria office and Syria experience is quite unique and innovative, is that we come as sort of a large machinery. And it's not only us HRAs supporting humanitarian coordinators, but it's very much based on the monitoring and reporting that is produced by um, this unit, but also on the legal advice that we are able to, pr to provide, as well as the work we're doing with CSOs and, and all the engagement. Um, next slide, please. So on this uh, one, a uh, couple of achievements that we've, we, we are able to, to report and to discuss now. Um, since six years, we we our main task was to effectively support the functioning of uh, the functioning of the protection sector or cluster, uh, but also not only the protection sector but other uh, other sectors uh, by creating mechanisms and tools, but also by engaging in the in the humanitarian program cycle, as I say, to allow a human rights based analysis of protection risks and violation and priorities. Um, and we've done this through, I mean, in different ways. One is um, one of the achievements by, by HRAs. Um, this is very much related to the work we've done with the protection cluster in Gaziantep, with your colleagues in Gaziantep. And this is the human rights reference group. Um, this, uh, I'm not going to go too much into details here because there's been a, there's a recent publication that is on the web page of the Global Protection Cluster. And I'm sure you all know about this recent paper by ODI and JPC on collaborative advocacy between humanitarian and human rights actors. I think it's in page six and we have a page dedicated uh, uh, to the human rights reference group, but just a few words to explain what we've done. Um, to respond to a gap identified back in 2015, uh, which really speaks to this collaborative approach and how we can work together. Um, so the Human Rights Reference Group was established in, in Gaziantep in 2015, when I arrived, when I was deployed, to bring together humanitarian actors and human rights um, NGOs, mainly Syrian NGOs, but also international NGOs, um, and initially it served um, as a platform to exchange on human rights and IHL concerns, 
but also to create to start creating this interaction between the members of the, the protection cluster and, and, and other clusters and this human rights community, which was not at that time necessarily engaged or involved or invited by the cluster. The situation in, in Syria, as you know, is quite challenging in terms of addressing human rights issues, in terms of human rights advocacy, in terms of um, um, of these issues that took a while to to um, to uh, to I mean, to to become issues that we on which we we work together. So we have established this coordination forum in full consultation with UNHCR as the CLA, uh, but also sustained by uh, by the cluster coordination team, of course, UNHCR and IRC. Um, and really, we complemented each other rather than competing each other. Obviously, I mean, the idea was to look at the identified gaps that were in terms of human rights and protection analysis, in terms of advocacy that was needed by the humanitarian coordinators. Uh, and it's really uh, something that we've decided we have actually named the group together with the, the previous cluster coordinator in Gaziantep. And then it became a, a place where we have not only the protection cluster coordination team, uh, Catherine and Mohammed, your colleagues in Gaziantep, who attend the meetings, who support the meetings uh, and the facilitation sometimes, but also a number of other cluster coordinators, because we of course believe, and OHCHR believes that protection mainstreaming also and the human rights mainstreaming goes beyond the protection sector and needs to really permeate uh, the other humanitarian sector. So, so in terms of the comprehensive analysis of the protection situation that has resulted uh, from this information exchange, um, I think this analysis has enabled the group to serve as a platform for a better coordination or better coordination of strategic advocacy on key protection issues. Um, and, and that's really important uh, as we, we now look at what we have and you will you will have more information on on that in, in the in the report in the in the paper I mentioned. The second achievement, and I'll try to be brief on this on the two second ones because I'm already um, I wanted to mention the work we're doing at a different level. Uh, as I said, the, the whole of Syria structure also involves the other hubs, Damascus and, and, and Amman, and here we have the whole of Syria protection sector. Uh, and here we've worked very extensively with the protection sector since at least 2000 and, I mean, 2015, but then um, on the occasion of the adoption of the protection strategy by the SSG, the SSG in Syria is the equivalent of your HCT, so it's the HCT in the country. And the idea was to um, contribute to collective protection and advocacy by this SSG, which is the whole of Syria strategic steering group, um, by focusing on four critical protection issues uh, that the SSG would work together to address through high level advocacy. And this is another achievement and a collective achievement, I would say, um, by and, and, and really long story short, the revised advocacy plan was endorsed by the SSG. Now we're looking at a way to operationalize this advocacy plan by inclu including by ensuring that we have a dedicated protection item on the agenda of each HCT. And that's what happens in a number of countries um, I've worked in. Um, and uh, really to have not only a protection discussion that takes place uh, involving the heads of agencies uh, and clusters, but also a regular protection update provided by the protection sector with the support of OHCHR human rights advisors. Um, the last one, and very briefly, one word on that, it's the HPC, so the way we've managed over the years to integrate human rights and IHL um, and also strengthen the protection language in the uh, HNO and H HRP. Um, it's been, I mean, since 2015, there's been 
increasingly more human rights protection and language. Um, in 2015, there was absolutely no uh, or probably no human rights language, very limited protection language in, in the in the HNO and HRP. Um, it's not been an easy game, but we've worked with the support of the protection sector to integrate uh, this uh, language and these concerns um, much more over the years. Next slide, please. So on the lessons learned, and again, I'll try to be brief. Um, first, to say what I've uh, said in the first uh, slide is that this HRA project and the Human Rights and Humanitarian Action project is a bigger machinery than just one expert um, providing advice to the humanitarian coordinator. It's effectively a, a package that includes the monitoring and reporting, as well as the advocacy and the legal tools uh, produced by our office, by OHCHR Syria. But it's also an easy access to UN human rights mechanisms and the political support through the High Commissioner Public Advocacy on, on IHL and, and, and human rights in Syria. The second lesson learned uh, from my experience is that we as HRAs are complementary to existing resources um, and we do not overlap with pre-existing advocacy support uh, to the resident coordinator or HC um, by, for example, of course, the protection cluster coordinators um, and the protection lead agency is doing its part. Um, so it's also fair to say that uh, the, the protection cluster and the, and the cluster system in, in, in itself has become so convu convoluted in, in processes and structure that the PC coordinators um, and I was a protection cluster coordinator in Haiti 10 years ago, uh, or, or have little time to, for advocacy support. Um, and there is a clear complementarity value in having human rights advisors supporting uh, the humanitarian leadership. Um, also in a complex context like Syria, where we need to address effectively a number of sensitive and difficult human rights issues, which humanitarian actors are not necessarily uh, in a position to do so. Um, and I'm talking about issues like detention or, or enforced disappearances or, or accountability for violations, which are issues that cannot uh, be necessarily um, and easily addressed by the protection cluster. Um, finally, a last last one on, on, this, on this lessons learned. Um, what we've also seen was the importance of reaching a consensus at the HCT level um, to be able to, to take the advocacy effort from different angles. Sometimes it's quite, it's, it has proven to be easier to work uh, with the humanitarian coordinator uh, to address a number of issues and then support um, and work together with the protection sector and other sectors to push uh, so and it's really important to have this sort of consensus and and common starting point among heads of agencies and among clusters with a sort of a, a common push at the intercluster level um, to be able to address a number of, of sensitive issues um, and then to bring uh, the protection analysis. And finally, next last slides on challenges. Few um, and of course the, the structure of this whole of Syria um, response is a bit uh, unusual, uh, which also means that the work of each human rights advisor has been very different from one um, hub to the other, including in terms of of uh, access to the to the UN country team or to the HC, but also in terms of the context uh, to contact with CSOs, attitude of partners. So so that's a bit difficult indeed to measure, but um, the second um, challenge uh, that we've seen is, um, and again, we've seen a lot of, of, of uh, progress here, but it's true that sometimes the humanitarian cluster and the protection cluster is not always inclusive enough to accommodate all the actors uh, that can influence the IHL and human rights situation on the ground. Um, and we've seen that, for example, the creation and the facilitation of 
a group like, like the Human Rights Reference Group um, in Gaziantep can actually complement uh, rather than duplicate uh, the coverage and activities of the cluster. Um, and again, I, I, I say that we've moved and we've done, made a lot of progress here because now you have Syrian human rights NGOs member of the protection cluster. Um, you have a lot of engagement by the protection cluster coordination team uh, through the human rights reference group. As I say, they're actively contributing, acti actively supporting. Uh, we have a retreat next week in Gaziantep with the protection cluster coordination team who has invited us human rights advisors to co-facilitate uh, a session precisely on this collaboration between the protection actors and, and human rights actors. So, so there's a lot of uh, um, there's a lot of, of progress that we've made um, since like six years. So I'll stop here, I guess. Uh, Valérie, over to you and I look forward to the discussion. Sorry, I was a bit long. Thank you. No, on the contrary, Elsa, this is so interesting and uh, you will see that there are a lot of questions coming your way uh, in the chat, uh, a lot of interest from colleagues to hear a bit more. So we will get uh, to those questions once we complete our panel. Thank you, colleagues who are online for being so engaged and uh, it's great to see such uh, an interest and I encourage you to use the chat function to ask questions and we will get back to them. But before then, I will give the floor to Ulad Zimir, who will give us uh, yet another perspective uh, uh, from Ukraine and the UN monitoring mission. So uh, over to you, please, uh, um, Ulad Zimir. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I'll really try to be short and uh, not to exhaust you. Uh, patience and readiness to hear to speak in head, so I'll, I'll try to be the quickest speaking head, but not, no guarantees. So colleagues, our mission uh, has a really broad mandate, uh, probably the broadest possible mandate for OHHR missions uh, in the field. So we do reporting, monitoring, protection by presence, technical assistance, legal advice. We do and the government often complain, they invited us and now they have a um, troublemaker. And definitely I need to, not to confess, but to admit we enjoy exemplary cooperation with UNHCR colleagues who are backbone for the protection clusters worldwide and in Ukraine we have really good cooperation and uh, Lydia Kuzmienka, I checked on the participants, uh, our colleague and good friend from UNHCR is, is here basically. So once again I'll present you the OHCR views on how we interact but basically probably once again if you want to know the UNHCR views how to interact with OHCR on the example of Ukraine you can reach out to our uh, Kyiv colleagues uh, UNHCR colleagues in Kyiv and they will tell you the truth so the other side of the stories but we believe we are the best is with UNHCR as well as with other partners in the protection cluster and basically, once again, we're not very much typical in some regards compared to some other OHCHR field presences because once again, shortage of resources, limited mandate doesn't allow us to be fully engaged in the humanitarian action, but we are fully determined as OHCHR, uh, as it was said by colleagues. But anyway, so our story wouldn't be too, you know, typical for OHCHR engagement into humanitarian action. So to cut it short, I will switch to, 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 to the presentation and I will say from the very beginning, I mean, you don't need to know the Ukrainian uh, crisis, which unfolds uh, since 2014, but just to explain simply, basically it was an armed conflict and it was big enough uh, in terms of uh, hostilities and the impact on the population, huge IDPs flows, and basically it was big enough to draw big international attention. So in 2014, Ukraine was flooded with international attention, with international organizations, including UN presence and with sufficient uh, financial and human resources to put in place uh, relevant uh, protection machinery. So if you proceed with the next slide, you would immediately see that, I mean, when the conflict broke out, we had immediately the protection cluster and definitely because OHCHR was there, basically by the time when the conflict broke out, we definitely became an integral part of the uh, all the protection uh, machinery and uh, effect, we even effectively co-chaired the protection cluster together with UNHCR. It wasn't for so long, but anyway, and then the, the, the UNHCR took uh, took the lead. But anyway, we're the part, natural part of this uh, coordination architecture from the very beginning. So what could be the, the, the entry points? I mean, we didn't need an, an entry point. It was uh, completely natural from the very beginning. 
And uh, clearly, clearly, once again, we were also OHHR uh, not lucky, but it was the fact we were a member of the HCT and sometimes in some countries, I heard that sometimes HCT is kind of exclusive a little bit to many actors. It's a kind of a big, big guns HCT and then the other small guns can be somewhere in the protection cluster. Um, but anyway, we are the part of the HCT and therefore it also enables us to be kind of um, uh, an actor, an actor in, the, in, in, in this field. So we fully participate in all the processes. Once again, read the books, all the uh, HNO, HRP, all the coordination structure, we are part of it. And once again, because we enjoy the cooperation of UNHCR, but otherwise by the nature of sins, uh, by the nature of the conflict in Ukraine. Next slide, please. And once again, what were the enabling factors? As I told you, I mean, there was a common understanding. We didn't need as a UN or as a protection cluster to struggle to explain that the crisis in Ukraine is a protection cluster. That was clearly from the very beginning. So surely, I mean, we reported a lot as a monitoring mission. We reported uh, on a monthly basis uh, public reports, which were read up to the Security Council with big attention. Definitely we helped to shape the uh, to shape the feeling that it's a protection a crisis. And surely, I mean, this was an entry point for an OECHR. It was natural that you have OECHR on board when you discuss the protection protection staff. So we may call it the uh, enabling factor. And it was also essential. We were physically present in the conflict zone when the during the most i mean we've been present there all the time but i mean even in times of uh, hostilities uh, intense phase of the conflict we had been in the conflict zone and that was also kind of an enabling factor for ohr to be a valuable member of the protection uh, cluster of the protection team and once again because up, up until now the conflict is considered to be a protection crisis i mean naturally we're there so these are the the if you may say, um, one may say, enabling factors for us to be in. Next slide, please. I'm half done my presentation, so just two minutes. More challenges and bottlenecks. Once again, I wouldn't call it, once again, I realized only before the presentation that the majority of the audience would be UNHCR colleagues. And once again, we don't have major problems in interaction with uh, UNHCR colleagues and with the protection cluster. So my slides would be rather addressed to OHCHR colleagues are working in this area and basically once again uh, as it was noted um, by the previous presenter sometimes there is certain overlap in this sophisticated architecture and once again sometimes we feel it's kind of a uh, too sophisticated and for us sometimes sometimes it's not kind of a very convenient to work on various uh, parallel or kind of duplicating traits of coordination and somehow but we believe it's almost inevitable but uh, this is actually the challenge and the small agency is and where a small agency the more challenge is to, to to be able somehow to have enough resources to sink into and to sink through the all this uh, sophisticated uh, coordination mechanism and lastly once again uh, uh, to be a participant, to be a meaningful participant of the protection cluster and the whole architecture, protection architecture, you need to participate. And that could be definitely a challenge because sometimes you don't have resources or time, or you have different priorities uh, once again to, 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 to get into it. So our advice and the bottlenecks which would need to be somehow addressed if UNHCR is in charge of putting in place this architecture or somehow facilitating or make, being a secretariat, whatever you, you mean, somehow to try to simplify it, to enable smaller agencies uh, to be to be part of sometimes they're small enough so they just abandon or participate uh, nominally so this is would be kind of a sort of recommendation and last slide please yeah how this could be addressed it's once again both recommendations on the slide which you see basically address our OHHR colleagues who need to try uh, still to go to all these groups to all this coordination Participate. If you don't do it, I mean, your voice and your concerns would be just ignored. And in, in, in the case of Ukraine, we sometimes have too many actors, so you need to struggle to get your voice being heard too, not necessarily by the UNHCR you know, colleagues, but I mean by the other uh, community, which, which is huge. So, And the, the second recommendation basically is related to the, the first one. It's basically... Uh, there could be some, you know, proactive effort from the protection clusters in cases when the OHHR field presence is not strong enough or doesn't have the capacity to engage us proactively to draw us in or somehow to request us to like proactively provide feedback to a certain document 
and rely on our reports. Once again, we issue a lot of reports and analysis. Even in case we are not there, please somehow try to get um, OHHR uh, views and analysis analysis uh, on board. And in some cases, once again, we can present fairly unique uh, unique expertise uh, uh, on issues. And yeah, sometimes we perceive there's not a black sheep, but troublemaker who cares about pure human rights vis-a-vis -vis humanitarian needs or broader like shelter needs and um, spo uh, not spoiling, but somehow deteriorating the relations with the duty bearers, especially in the conflict zone, armed groups, whatever. Therefore, please don't be afraid of us. We will not uh, spoil the uh, more neutral and less controversial stuff. I mean, um, please uh, reach out to us to get us engaged and take our views on board. This is basically in short. I had some answers to some questions on the on the panel, but once again, probably upon the discussion, I'll be able to answer. But I have a couple of answers to a couple of specific questions. Over to you, Valerian colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ulatsimir. And uh, I saw the reactions from our colleagues Lydia and Hugo also uh, confirming the good collaboration you have in the country. Um, I was inspired when you said. Uh, our collaboration was natural because you know Ukraine is a protection crisis and the links between protection cluster, um, its members, UNHCR and the mission were natural. You would uh, be surprised, maybe you're not surprised, but we don't see it that natural in other contexts, despite the fact that they are protection crisis as well. So it's good to hear the and good practice from Ukraine you have shared with us and uh, I'm sure uh, we can go more in detail further in the uh, in the discussion. So thanks to all our three panelists, colleagues. Uh, uh, wonderful, we see you now on screen. No more presentations, but I would like to bring to your attention some of the questions that our colleagues uh, uh, who joined us today raised, but also we received few questions ahead of the event that I will also bring um, to this uh, forum. So colleagues, you can still be posting questions. I will keep adding, but with the first round of questions coming to you. So uh, firstly, uh, a question, how does OHCHR coordinate human rights engagements with other UN uh, specialized mandate uh, agencies? So um, how is OHCHR supporting the work of other UN entities in regards to engagement with human rights mechanisms? Uh, this is the first question, and I will not assign any panelists. Uh, please pick up uh, the questions as you as you seem um, uh, as you deem fit. Going to other questions, uh, a lot on the example in Syria as well, and the fact that OHCHR is not physically present in Syria, as we heard. How do you collect data? in this kind of situation? How do you verify the accuracy of data if you are not physically present? And how to make it efficient through this remote monitoring and analysis, which is being done. At the same time, when you receive a lot of sometimes very sensitive information, how do you protect as OHCHR the witnesses uh, or the sources of information that is brought to you? And uh, 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 in addition to that, how do you collaborate uh, uh, with armed groups, armed actors? Uh, this is in relation to Ukraine, but also Syria. Is there collaboration with ICRC, uh, for example, on topics such as detention? So uh, more on the collaboration and uh, the more sensitive engagement, uh, if you can broadly uh, share with us some of the key, key highlights. Uh, in this first round, I would also like to bring to the panelists a question uh, from Shaista, uh, which is very interesting. Are there some minimum standards for joint collaboration, including advocacy, uh, coordination, communication, protection monitoring, so different aspects? Are there already existing minimum, minimum standards in terms of what is expected both from OHCHR as well as the protection cluster or UNHCR 
in terms of what can be done uh, despite the differences of different contexts and operations in which we are working. So I will stop here for the first round and turn towards you, our dear panelists. Uh, um, Said, would you like to start? Uh, thanks, Valerie. I mean, I started my presentation or I ended it up with like there is one no one size fits all approach and each of the experiences, whether in Syria or in Ukraine, has its own uniqueness. But I think we can agree that there are some enabling or, or conducive environment for this to happen. I mean, in Syria, the creation of this reference working group, having the space for a human rights discussion and having this discussion or this forum feeding the human rights advisors and also feeding the human rights analysis and its integration into the the uh, advocacy and also to the program cycle. I think that that this is how I mean, first, I think we need to think about what is the conducive environment? What are the enabling factors for this to happen? And I mean, is the structure in place is can can be promoting such or not? Uh, again, I think uh, I mean uh, also uh, Elsa uh, talked about now there is more human rights actors in the protection cluster or or there might be in other sectors as well. At the same time, also the Ukraine example also give us that uh, I think uh, the at uh, the early engagement on human rights is very important not uh, that it comes at a later stage and when you have some resistance and when you have more operational issues. So the early the engagement, the better you you can consolidate your collaboration and your partnership. So uh, again, I think also the example in the occupied Palestinian territory because uh, the office is established since 1996. It preceded the activation of the cluster system in 2009. So when you have an established field of presence and it's strong and it's well equipped, when we uh, took uh, lead of the protection cluster, we were able to bring all these and connect all the dots and, and we were able, we have the space and we have all the structure and the vehicles to drive this process. So I think these are uh, like several elements that I would see, uh, I mean, they, these were enabling factors for, for such a strong analysis and, and integration of human rights. I'll give, I mean, others also can uh, elaborate over. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Valérie. So um, maybe I'll take the, yeah, the, the first question on, on collection of, of information verification. So, Syria is not the only example where OHCHR is doing remote monitoring, right? There's there's other examples, um, Somalia. There's a number of places, including uh, Iraq, at some point, um, where we do that. So this is really based on um, on on a clear methodology that is not only based on experience, um, um, depending on the context, but also now very much supported by the HQ, where we have uh, the, our METS colleagues who are very much supporting uh, with, with, with guidance and tools. So in the Syria context, there's been a change uh, between the early years of the conflict where we had, we never had access per se, uh, but we were able to have human rights officers from the monitoring and reporting uh, unit traveling uh, to the different neighboring countries. So we were regularly um, um, traveling to Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon. There's a constant uh, monitoring of the situation uh, on IHL and human rights violations by the team from Beirut, working with primary sources and secondary sources, but we verify information with primary sources. It's a lot. It's incredibly challenging, um, particularly when it comes to, for example, the situation of besieged areas. I mean, we, we had a time like for years in Syria where most of uh, uh, the human rights violations and abuses were taking place in such areas. So it's not only in a place where we don't have access, but it's also in besieged areas inside Syria. So the collection and verification takes time. It's sometimes a bit frustrating because we are indeed, as the Human Rights Office, the only 
provider of information when it comes to CIVCAS, the civilian casualties. Um, so we, it, it takes time indeed, particularly when we have only three human rights officers looking at the entire territory with such uh, complex issues that we need to, to address. Uh, you can imagine that detention, for example, um, is is one of those issues where it's extremely difficult, uh, not only in the government controlled areas, but also in, in armed groups areas. That takes me to the to the question on detention with ICRC. So obviously we work with ICRC at different level. There's a lot of collaboration at the legal advice level. So our legal advisor, as I said, we have a rule of law and accountability unit um, who is also, I mean, he's, he's our legal advisor, also based in Beirut, is working very closely with ICRC uh, legal advisor and the team uh, on issues related to detention and forced disappearances, but also on other issues and other legal issues. And, and I take the example of the Turkish occupation in north uh, in northern Syria, which raises a number of legal issues, obviously, which has direct impact for cluster coordinators and for humanitarian clusters. And I, I was in, in, in many conversations at the inter-cluster group level in Gaziantep years ago when this first Turkish operation uh, started, and I'm and I'm actually calling from Istanbul, so I should be careful with what I say. Um, but but this raises a number of of legal issues that will determine access to services. So that's one of the things that we do um, is to provide legal advice and legal notes. So we've produced over nine legal notes uh, since six years. And obviously here, there's a lot of discussion, consultation with, uh, with ICRC. Um, on the protection of sources, um, that's one of the key aspects of OHCHR role, as you can imagine, and we do a lot of risk analysis, risk assessment. Um, any activity is preceded by a risk assessment, and it's something that we've done across the line and across the activities and across the offices. So we have a lot of experience. We also have an ASG, who is our head of um, uh, office in New York, who is in charge of particularly looking at this issue, not only of the protection of victims and, and witnesses, but also reprisal. So there's a, a lot of uh, of work being done at, at the field um, level, field office. Um, can I, shall I take the, the yeah, the, the, the question on the minimum standards? Uh, yeah, it's a long, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And, and indeed, I think that the, um, I don't recall the, the exact question, but I think there was, can we share the, what was the question? Uh, I guess the terms of reference of there what? There are already existing minimum standards on the collaboration that uh, are in place between OHCHR protection cluster, OHCHR, if we have something to draw on basically and refer to if we are, for example, in the field. Yeah, so first of all, I think it's it's a question to both the global protection cluster and to us, and, 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 and I really appreciate the efforts by the, the human rights team, engagement team, and, and, and what you're doing this year precisely to answer this question. There's no minimum standards per se, not that I'm aware of, apart from what you can find in the policies that we obviously all know by heart. <laughs> um, but the thing is that it's more... I think it's really more on, on the, how we collectively have managed since at least 10 years to look at best practices, lesson learned, and what works in, in, in certain contexts. And I remember this OHCHR-led um, exercise and on lessons learned in Haiti as we uh, led and we are leading and we uh, the protection cluster. We did the same in Syria two years ago, so we have a lessons learned exercise. And, and those exercises are bringing together uh, all of us to look into what can be done and what can be adjusted and adapted depending on the context. But again, as, as Saeed, said, Saeed said, it's not a one size fits all. It, it's really depending on the context, depending on the structure, depending on the response itself. And then, of course, it depends on individualities. But 
at the end of the day, what we need to reach, and that's exactly what uh, uh, Victoria's paper is, is helping to achieve, is really to have an institutional response beyond the different contexts um, that we are dealing with. It's really, what is it that we can do together? And, and then very much uh, um, depending on, on whether we can do it and, and how, how much resources, how much support we can get from, from beyond, because it's also, you can have a very active protection cluster in the field and a very good collaboration between a protection cluster and OHCHR, but if you don't have the support of an intra-cluster coordination group, an OCHA, as in charge of this humanitarian coordination mechanism, you will only be able to do protection and human rights mainstreaming at the protection cluster sector level, which is for us good, but not enough. We believe again that human rights integration goes beyond a cross sector. So not going to, I mean, I'm just going to stop, stop on this, but uh, there was also the uh, Victoria's question. I like your quick question, Victoria. <laughs> um, yeah. Indeed, I mean, I'm sure that we can all answer this question, but ensuring that the analysis of the human rights situation, is it your question? Yes, it's your question. What, are, what is the experience? Um, to inform the development, yeah. Can I just leave it to uh, my colleague from Ukraine and then go back to, to the question yes. from Victoria? We'll thank you. The second <laughs> round of questions and thank you so if much. I may. For uh, exhausting those questions, just for colleagues to know, and uh, we have Victoria Metcalf on the call who uh, really led the research of ODI on uh, the uh, opportunities for further collaboration between human rights and humanitarian actors. And you have the link to her research paper in the chat. And we are now working both at the level of the global protection cluster as well as UNHCR as an agency to provide some kind of guidance uh, uh, in terms of what is expected in terms of minimum uh, engagement with OHCHR. Uh, so to respond to Shaista, this is definitely now uh, on our table and we are working with Said and other colleagues on uh, follow in follow up to the ODI reports recommendation. Uh, it's good, Elsa, that you also mentioned OCHA. We have Dina from OCHA on, on the call, so we cannot stress enough also the support of OCHA in the intercluster coordination um, uh, in the field, so very well noted. Uh, Dina, if there are any aspects to highlight, uh, please uh, feel free. But before that, I go first to Ulad Zimir to respond to some of the questions and then I have a second round of questions that I collected in the chat and we'll go back uh, to the panelists. So over to you Ulad Zimir, please for the first round of questions. Uh, thank you, Valerie. colleagues. I'll, uh, I'll try to answer in a telegraph style because we're running short of the time so to, need to allow colleagues uh, to speak more. Very quickly, once again, the advice from OHHR would be to the to, to protection cluster. If, if you have really sensitive uh, human rights or sensitive prote protection issue, damp it to OHHR. It's our kind of, uh, definitely we, we all, sh all of us shall care about the protection, but once again, OHHR is kind of somehow perceived as the agency which deals with the most grave or most acute like uh, human rights or aspects of the protection crisis. So where can be useful in some context, probably the um, UN presences uh, feel sensitivities with the host governments or de facto authorities. So I mean, OHCHR is anyway black ship, so damp it, damp it on us. So on ICRC with Ukrainian experience, basically, yes, we enjoy exemplary cooperation in terms of access to detainees. And basically, both in the government controlled territory and the territory controlled by the armed group, definitely, you know, ICRC is extremely secretive. They, okay, don't like black box, never give any information. So we still manage to maintain ma meaningful dialogue and coordination with them and somehow coordinate our access efforts, especially in territory controlled by the armed groups where the access is sophisticated. Therefore, we advocate jointly for access of international monitors, not specific access for ICHR, specific access for ICRC. So we managed to coordinate and we would encourage basically the field presences to work with ICRC. It is possible. In Ukraine, we have rather positive experiences of interaction and could be extremely useful. On interaction with armed groups, once again, in Ukraine, both UNHCR and us and other actors, basically we have uh, understanding that the de facto authorities or armed groups have the human rights uh, obligations, their duty bearers, and we do 
Uh, we don't uh, carry out the t capacity building that would be too much, but definitely advocacy in terms of uh, the obligations in terms of protection and human rights compliance. We we do it and we're physically present, uh, present in territory controlled by the armed groups, UNHCR as well. So basically, once again, the, the experience it's possible. We have some many limitations, natural limitations and restrictions from the armed groups and some kind of political controversies not to make the government too mad host government, not creepy recognitions that our activities don't create a semblance of creepy recognition of these entities, but in principle we do interact with them and we believe it's conducive uh, to the protection. So we have rather positive experiences and Kiev colleagues would uh, share with you. More. With the somatic agencies, very good questions. Uh, definitely, I mean, human rights cover everything, but once again, we somehow intuitively, somatically, if it's about IDPs, surely we, we engage, but mostly it's UN, uh, UNHCR uh, piece of cake, but sometimes with the joint advocacy, it's the same with the children. Once again, okay, children, it's for UNICEF and uh, we somehow coordinate. So once again, there are no clear lines. And when there is a robust agency, which um, with a specific mandate, we don't try to interfere because we have too many human rights on the plate, but we always find a meaningful uh, form for uh, joint advocacy and action. And on the prevention, I don't know to which extent it's common for other field presences, surely for field presences where there is ongoing armed conflict. We're in charge of civilian casualty reporting and in Ukraine we're considered the UN agency which is in charge of like purely military part of the conflict, civilian casualties, impact of hostilities on civilians. So therefore, therefore I believe and our findings of OECHR definitely inform the advocacy by the protection cluster. So surely, surely, I mean, we have a role, uh, we have a role to play. Uh, and I'm not speaking about peacekeeping missions that separate uh, separate instance. So definitely, I mean, we, we, we can be useful for the protection cluster with our knowledge and expertise. And the last one, the question, I mean, how our analysis informs HRP. Surely you, UNHCR colleagues, I mean, very often, OK, it's a collective effort, but sometimes a pen holder, very often it's UNHCR who drafts all the papers, and this is the case for for Ukraine, I mean, it, it, it's simple, basically, read our reports. In the case of Ukraine, there is a plenty of our reports that plus share with us the documents. It's always last last minute drafting and uh, no one saw the last draft. I mean, please uh, allocate five minutes to share it with OECHR. That wouldn't be a waste and will help, <laughs> will help, will help to, to, to form uh, the language. But once again, in the case of Ukraine, we basically, as I explained to you, we don't have a major problem that we find sometime or no human rights language in the HRP. This is not the case, which is also the result of our good cooperation with UNHCR. Sorry for being too talkative. Over to you, back colleagues. Thank you, Zamir, and it's good to hear the good practices from Ukraine. I see Dina's comment or quite, uh, reaction in the chat. Uh, that it would be good to um, maybe get more details, but even bilaterally, how you have managed to weave in the human rights into the HNO HRPs. This is what we are looking now at with OCHA, uh, how basically use the momentum of the call to action launched by the Secretary General and ensure that we have a more effective human rights centered response, planning and response. So let me turn, we have time, so we uh, I can turn uh, for the second round of questions to you, dear panelists, and uh, pick on maybe other uh, types of questions or angles that were raised. And first question is, uh, appears very simple, but very important. If you can uh, provide a list of uh, the countries where human rights advisors are present on the 40, 43 or 45 you mentioned, uh, this will be very useful for our colleagues. Uh, there was a specific question on India, but I'm sure um, we can find out. Is there actually some kind of a link online where we can see based on country, what is the OHCHR presence? So uh, we can find out somewhere in a centralized manner what is the uh, different met, um, presence of OHCHR in a country. So this is the first question. Second question is, can OHCHR help and support with capacity building um, uh, around uh, uh, human rights aspects, collaboration with human rights mechanisms? If so, um, can we take it forward and approach directly OHCHR uh, for such an initiative or human rights advisors directly? The third question would be around uh, advocacy and there were various questions related to advocacy. You already touched on the question, uh, what is actually the 
mm, I would say, um, input or power or uh, impact of human rights advisors in uh, ensuring that humanitarian program cycle is more human rights centered or uh, that the, the human rights based approaches are more weaved in, if you could uh, elaborate on that a bit more. But also, if you can give more example, uh, Elsa uh, directed to you uh, in relation to the human human rights reference group in Gaziantep. What has been the impact of your advocacy? If you have some concrete examples uh, and uh, the work around HR and IHL violations uh, you you mentioned. Going to the next. Uh, if you could reflect a little bit more on what are the enable, enabling factors uh, for effective collaboration between OHCHR protection cluster, OHCHR civil society members part, so as part of the protection cluster or uh, UNHCR. So uh, if you have any thoughts on that. And finally, I would suggest to conclude also with a question on what is the role of OHCHR in breaching the collaboration with peace building actors and uh, the work on prevention? So over to you colleagues, uh, a lot going your way, but extremely interesting questions. Uh, I don't know if you want to go in the same order or if you feel free, please to to take the floor. Um, maybe I start, Saeed, or um, I'll, I'll start with uh, Victor Victoria's first question on, on, on enabling factors. I would say that, first of all, I think that the understanding of the centrality of protection is key for all of us. And sometimes we just are in a situation where and it happens everywhere. I mean, not only we we are uh, working with um, colleagues who um, either don't necessarily know <laughs> the centrality of protection, and I'm not talking about the, the field level protection cluster itself. I mean, it goes beyond. It's actually, um, again, centrality of protection is, is a tool for everyone. It's not only for protection actors. So it's something that needs to be, um, that we need actors to be aware of, to know, and to know how to use um, at some point, you know, in the Syria context, we would try to use the human rights uh, upfront action plan, which was actually a very bad idea. I remember discussions uh, of, of uh, back in, in 2017 where we couldn't even uh, address the human rights upfront action plan because that was just a no-go uh, given the complexity and the sensitivity of, of the context. But for us, it doesn't really matter because the human rights up front um, and the centrality of protection uh, actually builds on the human rights up front and then vice versa. And the um, the guidance note for humanitarian co coordinators on the centrality of protection is also a very good map and roadmap to explain and to basically lead and, and guide humanitarian leadership and humanitarian uh, actors. So, so one is, of course, the understanding, and there's a lot of work to be done by all of us uh, in terms of capacity building uh, on, on, and really the practicalities of, of the centrality of protection. Um, the, the, the second is really what, what I think you're doing well this year is really to look at best practices. Um, I remember starting in Gaziantep using an example that I, 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 I actually used back in Mali in Bamako where I was trying to get WHO and health cluster uh, colleagues in the ancestor of the human rights reference group uh, which was called Groupe de Travail sur Accès à la Justice et Rule of Law, uh, uh, GTAJ, whatever. It was the same, but we did the same uh, in, in Mali uh, in a peacekeeping setting uh, with the MINUSMA. And the idea was really to, to have uh, health workers visiting pre-trial uh, individuals in pre-trial uh, detention facing uh, a number of challenges as, as uh, and mental health challenges. And that was a good example that I used with WHO and other uh, actors back in Gaziantep to explain that we can work together very much depending on a, a, a strict risk analysis 
uh, and a good understanding of what is at stake. And, and again, that's why I mentioned this risk analysis that the office is doing all the time uh, on what is it that the victim uh, or a witness uh, is exposed to and how we, can we mitigate all th together this kind of risks. So I think the second is really best practices to, to actually operationalize the centrality of protection and say, well, actually this works. This works in other contexts um, and we can use it as a way to uh, maybe convince others who are a bit hesitant or resistant. Um, the uh, idea, as I said in, in, in one of the in my presentation of a, a common starting point and, and a consensus at the HCT level is also important. I think it's sometimes helping and that's why the interaction and, and your question, Victoria, is, is good because it's it's really both in terms of the interaction between the cluster and OHCHR, but also between UNHCR as the CLA and OHCHR at different level, at the HCT level. If we manage to push and to adopt and to endorse a, a protection strategy or and, and that needs to be operationalized by everyone, then of course, this will help having an effective uh, implementation of, uh, again, uh, of what we try all to achieve, which is this collective protection outcomes. So these are few ideas, but um, um, this follow up question, maybe I don't know if I have answered your question, Victoria, but I think it's a discussion that we wanted to have. But the, your follow up question on the HNO. Um, so we um we we work through of course we work with the protection sector to ensure that at least we're consulted uh we share a lot in terms of civil and casualties and information uh on, on human rights violation you know so that's what we've done uh no later than last week with uh, with a man so we do share upon their request this kind of information um the, at large, the humanitarian community and, and, and leadership relies on OHHR for civilian casualties and for this kind of reports because we are the only one providing this verified information. Again, I really insist on verified information. We are we are the only actor with this mandate and with this capacity, uh, it, even when it's it's challenging, but to provide this information. So there's a lot of information that feeds into that informs the HNO. The fact that we also decide to present a project in the HRP in a number of contexts also helps not only discussing, um, and that's what we're doing now with Samir and colleagues at the whole of Syria level uh, and OCHA to discuss the strategic objective of the HRP. Sometimes we also have the ability to be consultant and to suggest a number of activities and indicators, but also to frame uh, a number of, of uh, not a number actually, one when we are lucky <laughs> to frame a possible strategic objective, which is, of course, you know, coming from outside, this kind of, you know, enhancing the protection response by um, addressing IHL concerns, um, but also very much looking at, for example, the engagement with human rights mechanisms and what is the impact, which actually leads me to to the first question on, on impact. Um, always difficult to measure impact, but we have a lot of one of the experience of the HRG is really in the health cluster, uh, sorry, in the health sector, uh, where obviously Syria is known as one of the worst crises in terms of attacks on healthcare. Um, back in 2017, we had something like 35, 40 attacks on, on hospitals and medical units uh, um, per month. So this was really critical. We've done a lot of work with WHO, the health cluster and uh, and, and Syrian uh, medical NGOs and physicians for human rights to raise uh, the issue, but also to ensure that there was more advocacy by, by humanitarian coordinators uh, with, again, strong data and then verified information. So that's one of the impact because we've managed to engage the Special Rapporteur on, on the right to health, um, who came to Gaziantep for a roundtable, the previous one, and now we are re-engaging with a new Special Rapporteur on the right to health 
She's a specialist on sexual re reproductive health and rights. Uh, she's from South Africa. She's extremely active and, 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 and very keen to engage. So this is one of the example of, of, of the impact, but, but broadly we've managed, because also of the participation of the HC, the, D, the deputy regional HC uh, in the human rights reference group, uh, and, and, and again, he participated because he was actually one of those five years ago to call for the creation of, of such a human rights uh, group because it was addressing a gap. Uh, so the fact that he's there also raises this profile and and we and through this group we managed to 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 really connect the dots between what we're doing at the at the intercluster level with clusters with this integration of human rights but also at the HCT so we have different levels of of engagement of of where we can influence influence the the response I don't know if this was clear enough, but uh, very happy to, yeah. Thank to you discuss. so much, Elsa. Yeah. That is uh, very useful. There was a question in the chat. If you can please post uh, uh, the guidance, the link to the guidance in the chat, the guidance you referred to, uh, to humanitarian leadership on how to take forward the centrality of protection forward. Um, there was also a question in relation to the how do you see um, the impact of the HCT protection strategy in your context? I would suggest Elza Uladzimir if you have any points on that, if you can post it in the chat. Uh, and I'm turning towards Said. Uh, we have about three, four minutes. If you can also uh, provide some, uh, shed some light on some of the questions. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, um, Valerie. I mean, from my side, uh, I mean, human rights protection, these are all collective uh, outcomes for the whole humanitarian actors to to uh, to um, to go ahead. But I mean, for me, I still see the, the structures, whether the intelligence, the coordination systems are not conducive enough to promote such collective outcomes. First, because we still feel the silo effects of clusters working separately, and I, I, see, I still see it. OCHA is not doing enough to bring everybody to the table, and and um, so I'm talking here humanitarian coordinators, resident coordinators, bring everybody to the table. How can we have more the common country analysis and HNO integrated with each other, and then you you agree how the humanitarian development actors can work and, and 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 works towards these collective outcomes as well as also we are not seeing much emphasis on enabling localized assistance and enabling local actors because they are much more efficient they are much more timely in their response they are much more also committed to 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 servicing the people all of the time, the cluster is always late in terms, and there are so many delays because of the structures. The uh, the, the the current systems do not enable uh, such participation of affected and crisis uh, affected communities. So uh, I see. Uh, I think there are a number of agendas that are very much linked to human rights, localization, accountability of affected population and how much the system is integrating and looking at such a crisis in a more preemptive way, more anticipatory, where are the risks and who are the ones that will be left behind and who are the will be at the higher risk. Uh, I think we're not doing that in a, in a very comprehensive way and we all the time uh, try to improvise things and, and much of the response sometimes is not based on joint uh, protection risk analysis, but more on assumptions uh, that are not well well founded. So I, I think that's my reflection on this side. There was a question also about the capacity building. I mean, uh, I mean, the human rights engagement task team has been rolling out this human rights module. We're happy to discuss with you the details of any specific uh, training on any of the international human rights mechanisms. And we can reach out to the relevant divisions within OSHR to facilitate such training. Uh, I know we are late, but I mean, that these are just some reflections from my side. Over. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Said, and your call uh, for uh, um, 
do more, do more collectively and uh, uh, be grounded with uh, the local initiatives, actors, human rights, education, empowering local po population is well noted. Uh, I know Dina on, on the call is uh, uh, for sure very attentively listening and would like to come in, but uh, I'm afraid our uh, time is uh, already coming to an end for this uh, uh, exchange, very rich exchange extremely interesting. I take few uh, action points on on our side from from this session and thank you Elsa for posting um, uh, the resource in the chat and actually starting from this very simple point I think we can do better as a human rights engagement task team to bring together the relevant resources actually to start with as a reference point and this is also building a uh, block for the next step as i mentioned in follow-up to the odi um, uh, research paper uh, to support you with some kind of guidance on the so-called minimum requirements on collaboration uh, which is also um, contextualized uh, depending on which operation you are in, what are the modalities, uh, the position of relevant actors, stakeholders, etc. So those are definitely two points. I further uh, also um, reiterate the point on good practices. I think it's never enough. Uh, we are hearing about good practices, but we are struggling sometimes when colleagues say, OK, but tell me in which country it has worked, connect me with colleagues. So um, I also ask colleagues who are online, if you have other examples of uh, things that worked out where uh, you have seen impact of such collaboration, if you can please proactively reach out to us and we would be very keen to, uh, to capture those uh, good practices um, going forward. I also think there is a, a lot we can do and will do um, on the mainstreaming of uh, stronger human rights approaches throughout the HPC cycle, as Elsa also mentioned that it's part uh, of the key components of your work and Dina uh, highlighted in the chat that this is something we are now, now working on as the Global Protection Cluster Human Rights Engagement Task Team as well as OCHA. Uh, and UNHCR angle. So quite a lot for us to follow up uh, on going forward. Um, we will, of course, not stop here. Uh, we strongly encourage all colleagues online to take this moment as a, an opportunity for reflection on how we can further strengthen the collaboration with OECHR in its different shapes and forms. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to me or to other colleagues online if you would like to uh, brainstorm further in relation to your specific uh, field context. So thank you again very much. Thanks to all uh, our panelists. Thanks to Elsa, Said, Uladzimir. This has been very insightful and interesting. Colleagues online, uh, we will meet again for our next uh, webinar uh, on 13th of December. The time will change this time. It will be three hours earlier, so at 11 o'clock Geneva time, and it will focus on human rights education. So if you are interested, stay tuned. We will share the save the date uh, very soon. Thank you uh, very much, uh, colleagues, and to look forward to our further engagement through the Human Rights Engagement Task Team. Have a good rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.